Welcome, Tales of Glory listeners. I'd like to welcome you to the big episode 57. I'd like to welcome back my two listeners and a dog. Exciting stuff today. I'm kind of doing something a little different today. I know you guys have reached out to me about street ministry and street training from stuff in my past about Night Strike. And I was actually working on training material for another church on spiritual warfare. And I just hit one of my hard drives and all of a sudden there was like this gold vein of old training material I had done over years and there's a ton of it sitting there and i thought well there's some good information there that you people are asking for so why don't i just cover that i'm actually thinking about down the road this is actually training material that was put together um, for classes and for churches to go out and do real street ministry and i might just slap this all together for like a buck 99 and put it for a digital download if that's okay with you guys um, cover the costs of producing. Yeah, right. <laughs> if I get one person that might cover the cost of producing, right? Anyhow, what it's going to be here is um, I'm just going to do a test run, you guys, to see what you guys like it, and a little sampling. And I'm going to talk about Open Heaven. And this information comes from my experience when I did prophetic evangelism and I went out in the streets. I went to some very dangerous places to do street ministry where Christianity wasn't widely accepted. And in some cases, there was a violent response to Christianity. Um, for some of those who know, Night Strike was a ministry I, I led from Bob Johnson when he um, retired from it back in 2009, I believe. And I kept it till about 2016. And there was some exciting stuff there. I went to some very dark, dangerous places. We're in San Francisco, if you can imagine, right? Some of you guys outside of California, oh my God, what's he talking about here? Yeah, I'm talking about Satanism, I'm talking about homosexuality, I'm talking about all sorts of stuff. Not knocking these guys, not knocking what's going on, but I want to publish the environment that says it wasn't Christianity receptive. In some cases it was. We have a fabulous minister out here, Pastor Evan Prosser, for the Homeless Church. Killing it, he's killing the city. I always joke about... When I grew up to be a minister, I want to be Pastor Evan Prosser. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Amazing guy. Assembly of God pastor, him and his wife, April Prosser. And they actually um, were doing night strikes in parallel with what we were doing. And they're still doing it now, even though I'm not doing it. So he's an amazing guy, and I want to give a shout out to him. Anyhow, I received messages and things from some of you listeners about, well, how do you start this stuff? How do you get into it? And when I found this stuff, I go, oh my God, I laid it out already a long time ago to train other churches and train some of the people in my churches how to do street ministry in hostile environments. And what do you do? How do you do if you want to take ground? How do you, how do you conquer ground? And that was some of the stuff I conquered here. How do you give prophetic words? And we're going to go into this too. How do you, you know, start? I think the best place to start right now was actually one of the last modules. It was like module D or something at the end about keeping an open heaven. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Well, anyhow, um, real quick too, I, at the end of the year, Spotify gave me this cool little award that Tales of Glory produced 72% more content in Spotify than any other religious podcast. Yeah, this little podcast that <laughs> we have two listeners, a dog, we produced 72% more content than the, the big guys out there. That's kind of cool. Awesome, guys. I'd like to thank the listeners for your support and tuning in and just listening and watching us. I'm, I'm trying to produce ministry relative content and that's what i'm doing today so today what we're talking about is supernatural ministry on the streets and how do you do it and a lot of this pertains to homeless ministry and a lot of this pertains to just basic street ministry and hostile environments or if you're going into like we used to do we used to sneak into zucchini festivals that you know and just set up a tent like hey you know get a free reading and like oh cool you know put people people accept the new age and don't accept christianity um i don't think we call it a free reading we i can't remember what we called it um there was some menu we put out there that sounded new agey, but it wasn't. <laughs> when they came in, we just gave them encounters with God. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. You guys psychics? We're like, nope, uh, it's psychics. Um, and I'm going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about the progressive times, how we, we came in covertly and did ministry like this. I even went into pagan fairs. I went to witchcraft fairs and things like that and orchestrated, and orchestrated um, prophetic ministry there very safely and there's there's ways to do it and to operate in the supernatural and that's some of the stuff i'm going to talk about here today i think a good place to start was actually when i was going through this material and correcting it in grammarly i go wow this open heaven thing might be a good place to start for people going hey how do we go into street ministry and do stuff like this and where should we start so i think the last chapter should have been the first chapter and <laughs> so here we go i'm going to present it today and on tales of glory this is what we're going to talk about
Open heaven and street ministry. So why is it important to keep an open heaven and street ministry? Because this is supernatural ministry. When we're working with the homeless on the streets, or you're working in a, an environment like we went to the Castro, that was um, with homosexuals and stuff, to you know, give them prophetic words. This was supernatural ministry. We're not in a soup kitchen. We're not pouring a ladle of soup. You know, we're doing such and such and just handing them food and sending them on their way. We were working to give each and every soul we encountered on the streets a divine encounter from the Father in Heaven. Capital F Father. Um, and I use it on purpose because a lot of times, like when someone recovering charismatic, we say, Papa, Papa, Papa. And I found out that was a watered-down version for seeker-friendly churches because they were having issues with the Father in Heaven. They couldn't call Him Father. So I strictly refer to the Father as the capital Father in Heaven. I don't refer to Papa. If you do, that's fine. I just want to let you know. It's, a lot of times it was indicative that somebody couldn't go to the Father in Heaven calling, calling the capital F Father. And a lot of times it's indicative to issues on the streets or issues going on with their own lifestyle and so forth. But anyhow, I don't want to gross there. I want to start talking about, like I said, this stuff's going to get intense, right? So why is it important to keep an open heaven in ministry? Because the enemy sends in spirits of distraction and sends in demons. And we've had a lot in street ministry. You want to keep an open heaven, get the attention of the Holy Spirit. So we want to bring him down and we're, we're showing the Holy Spirit we're serious that we, he, we want him to move through us. Cool stuff, all right? So we're talking about the supernatural. We're talking about working on the streets where it's dangerous. And we're not in a soup kitchen. We're, we're out, you know, as I called it, a lot of times when I work, brought the Bethel teams down, the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, I explained to them, a lot of times, you guys, where you have been, you operate in the zoo. Now we're going down the streets where there are no cages and the animals do attack. And they get these wide looks at them. And at the end of the night, they, thought, they found out why. But we're under the protection of the Holy Spirit and the Father in Heaven. There was some incredible encounters that happened through that. So let's start here. So this is the Night Strike Ministry Boot Camp. That's what I'm going to call the course. This was Module 5, Keeping an Open Heaven. So open Heaven. Open Heaven is an environment that encourages the Holy Spirit to manifest. We're not out there go, we're going to get whacked tonight. We're going to get wrecked. We're going to really show up. No, we're out there showing the Holy Spirit we need to have an anchor point and we need your protection, we need your covering and we're serious about this ministry. So we want to create an open heaven over our team and over the, over the area we are ministering in. So Luke 3, 21 through 22, verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. Verse 22, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from the heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now recall too, after this, was it in Luke 4? After Jesus was baptized and empowered in the Holy Spirit, he went out to confront Satan. That's why we have this verse here. We want the Holy Spirit to come down and be with us on the streets and protect us, and we want to operate supernaturally. It's intentional, but it's intentional with the intention of the love of God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So we're creating that space for them to move in. We want you here. We want you down here. We want you to protect us, and we want to keep this an open heaven as we move to protect us. These are dangerous streets. I was in some very dangerous streets, man. There was, there was murders happening all the time. We, you know... We had to change streets for ministry because there was gunfire or because there were stabbings. You know, we saw this stuff. We were in gang, gang um, areas too. It took time to conquer. We're conquering grounds here. Revelation 4.1 After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So yeah, we can. There is, there's conceptual things of open heaven we're trying to model here. Point number one, sensitivity to the movement of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit with us. He's going to bring the Father encounters. He's going to move through us. He's the helper. He's the teacher. And we are going to move through prophetic through the Holy Spirit. So what I'm talking about here, I had an interesting observation I made during my time ministering on the streets of Night Strike Worship. 
the presence of the Holy Spirit may not necessarily mean the Spirit is moving to heal. Instead, the manifestation may be for the present, be present for the worship. Does that make sense? We're worshiping, we're bringing him in. We don't control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to do what he wants it to. And the worship has to be authentic and from the heart and pure worship. So maybe sometimes you just can't go out there and prepare worship sets like you do at church. We're going to do this one, number one, number two, number three, number four. You know, all we had was one person with a guitar, no microphone. I eventually brought on a microphone because we had bigger crowds we had you know, to listen to. It was a small little, one of those little mics you bought at Costco with a speaker. You hooked those up with an amp, and that was it. It was super simple. I just needed to find the person that was willing to come out in the streets and play, and a lot of times there were. It was awesome. Anyway, the point I make, when you do the open heaven and you do the worship on the streets initially, and we'll talk more about this, so step number one is open worship, open heaven. We want a manifestation of the Holy Spirit with us before we enter the streets. And the Holy Spirit will move how he wants to. I've had at times where he's having worship and we're not even praying yet, somebody might get healed. You know, in the, in the group we're with, or one of the homeless people that showed up, like, wow, and minister, ministering just starts happening, right? It, it is what it is. It's kind of cool. So you let the Holy Spirit move the way he wants to, and, you, and we'll talk about this. So in an open heaven environment, the Holy Spirit can roam through a meeting place on his own and heal people without ever having someone pray for them. What, Mike? I thought you had to lay on hands. No, this is some cool stuff we thought. I want you to keep in mind, too, we always met at the same place for Night Strike, and that was our anchor point. This makes sense. We had a statue we met at, and we started worshiping there because we knew that's where we went to to conquer the land. We've been there, I mean, since Bob Johnson was there and um, his team before, you know, he handed it over to me. Always met the same place, and that was the anchor point for the open heaven. And the spirituality in that area of the city knew it. Sometimes the dumb demons would show up during worship. It was crazy. You know, and just or the, the, the drugged out people, or what would happen? People come show up and get healed. It was crazy. So, number two, keepers of open heaven must be sensitive to the will of the Father and the movement of the Holy Spirit. God is not a genie who does our bidding. God moves and we operate corporately with Him. So it sounds very methodical right now, but it's not. What it's doing is we have an open heaven. We're worshiping. We're having people worship. And the people that came in for prophetic ministry are dialing in during this time too and feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit, listening to what He has to say. Sometimes they'll get directions on what streets they need to go down, gone to from Him during that worship time and so forth. So it's it's... It's cutting loose and letting the, you know, submitting to the Holy Spirit of what he wants to do on the streets that night. Very interesting. It's kind of funny because um, when I brought new people out, and we, we always brought food and socks with us. And many times, like when we go on our walk, maybe we'd, we'd walk down the streets and the Holy Spirit would take us somewhere. And we'd stay in that one spot for an hour. And we'd encounter these people, maybe homeless, or maybe they weren't homeless, maybe they're tourists. And just ministering to them, and it just you know the Holy Spirit was all over it. Sometimes we come back with extra food. Or otherwise, I you know I get a phone call from another team like, "Hey, it's been 15 minutes. We already ran out of food." I'm like, How did you run out of food? <laughs> you know, it's like were you just handing stuff out? Were you not talking to people? And so the idea is that the the food is the icebreaker for the homeless to to talk with them. And they'll sit and chat with you. You don't have to start hitting them right away with spiritual stuff. Just talk about what's going on with them and stuff and. After a while, you know, they, they notice you more and more and they open up to you. They've seen you praying for other people and they may ask you to pray for them too or pull you upside. I don't want maybe to see me. You come pray for me. Things like that. It, it takes time and maturity to operate in this and you wait on the Holy Spirit to know when it's time to minister. Interesting stuff. So again, God is not a genie. We don't tell him what to do. Like, oh, I'm going to go pray for that person over there. Did God highlight that person? Did God tell you? It's all operating on the Holy Spirit. So back to keepers in open heaven are worshipers, worship leaders, intercessors, seers, individual ministers, and pastoral leadership. So everybody is involved in keeping an open heaven. So what I mean by um, I have extra people, intercessors, seers, individual ministers, and pastoral leadership. I had intercessors who stayed at home. They didn't want to go on the streets, which was, was fine, but they stayed at home on the nights we were on the streets and they would do intercession for us. And they text us when things were going on. I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but it was good to have intercessors at home, staying in tune with the Holy Spirit, 
keeping an open heaven. So you have the worship going on at your anchor point, and you can just leave the worshipers there and come back later. Sometimes more homeless hang around those people and talk with them while they play. And you have the intercessors, and you have the seers too, who are sitting at home trying to see if any individuals we should be looking out for and stuff like that. So you build up this entire group, some, some of the ministry team. It takes time. And some people hit the streets, or some people are at the anchor point just listening in intercession, or some people are at home you know, texting and seeing what they're hearing. Cool stuff. Cool stuff to wrap around this. That's, so street ministry is getting slightly more complex, huh? <laughs> it's not just going out there and worshiping, but there, there's reasons to this. You need the protection. Reason three, keepers of open heaven must live humbly and exercise humility. They must understand the costs of their ministry. There is a deep relationship with the Father on a supernatural scale. The keepers understand the price of ministry and the level of spiritual warfare coming their way. What does that mean, Mike? That sounds kind of harsh. The more and more you work on the streets, like I worked on some very dark streets, the so demons didn't like us out there. The regional spirits didn't like us out there. And they will do things afterwards too. So that's why you want to keep an open heaven. These things don't follow you home. These things don't trash your finances, or trash your income, and trash your ministry and trash your relationships. They can do that. But there's going to be a cost to this. And it's including in church too. There's going to be some shakeups in church of people who thought we were friends. If you listen to me, Tales of Glory, I've said this time and time again that. Deeper you go into dark spiritual warfare, you know, don't don't pick fights with your friends. I'm not saying that. But weird things will happen where a bus will broadside you in relationships. And you're going, where the heck did that come from? What's going on here? I don't get it. I understand it. And you have to work deep with um, the Heavenly Father to protect um, relationships which are good. And even ones you thought you were good, you have to disconnect with. And it's just strange. It's like these trials that go on. Deep stuff, man. You're going into a deep ministry. This is a supernatural ministry. You have to be mature for this. Weird stuff hits your way and you have to know how to deal with it. But also, they must recognize the difference between a demonic attack and the father asking them to die to themselves in the form of a trial. There is a price at this ministry level the father calls you to, and it is not the next level in Christian maturity or walk. This is a calling. Again, when you're doing street ministry, you may go home and have a horrible week, a horrible month, or a horrible season. And you're going, help, I'm being demonically attacked. That's what the average um, non-mature Christian will say. The more mature Christian will know, oh no. In order for God to move me deeper into this ministry, he's revealing some stuff about myself I need to clean up. And he will permit demons to highlight that to you in the form of demonic oppression. So you have to go in the form of trial and working with Jesus and work this out and clean it out. Like I said, there's a price of ministry. It's just, you, you know, the he has to have you guys cleaned up, and he has to have you guys in a place where he could take you deeper into supernatural ministry. This is part of sanctification. Again, this is, does this sound like St. Teresa of Avila to you? I'm just put, putting the application side of this, right? Those of you turn into St. Teresa of Avila in the interior castle, this is exactly what's going on here. Because you guys are going to see healings, you're going to deal with demonic. God's going to have to keep your pride in check, and he's going to have to hit your pride with a bat. That's what I'm saying. Um, many times you're not going to rock. I'm starting a new ministry because I saw the supernatural and I'm moving in it and God's calling me this and God, you know, you'll fall flat in your face. Maybe God just wanted you on the streets and just operating there. That's, that's the way I always felt. That's where I was. Um, but I had a large ministry team behind me and it wasn't meant to be in stadiums. It wasn't meant to be on TV shows and that sort of thing. And this is where the majority of us fall in ministry. We are the hands and feet um, usually by the time somebody has a ministry they're, um, and they're on stages and they're, you know, they're, and they're on TV shows, they're unreachable by the others. You are the reachable. You are the hands and feet. And that's why God does this. We're, we're never meant to have a huge ministries. I know it goes against the uh, apostolic um, reformation. Oh, you, know, you need to dream dreams and dream big. Yeah, you can dream dreams, but God may keep you in a place because he needs you accessible to reach the lost. And it won't happen from many times from a stage because the lost aren't going to show up to a Christian event. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. But you're, he wants you to reach them on the streets. And the enemy doesn't like this, that you're infiltrating his environment. So that's what I'm saying. There's a heads up here. There is a price when you enter into this. You'll see it right away. Um, you're married. You have relationships. You know, he'll, throw, he'll throw huge, nasty wrenches. And don't get mad at your spouse. A lot of times, God's using the demons to reveal what is wrong with your relationship to strengthen you. And a lot of times it's an ouch. So, sounding like it's more complicated. 
I'm telling you guys, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, kids. Ah, open heaven for street ministry. Always keep an open heaven when ministering the streets. Like I said, we had our anchor point, which was a statue for Night Strike, and we kept a, um, either a ministry team back there or just a minister playing guitar, and we had, like I said, bodyguards with them or somebody. They never left them alone. There was somebody back with them. And a lot of times it was maybe another minister who couldn't walk the streets would sit with them um, and minister to the homeless that came their way because a lot of ministers just enjoyed listening to the worship music. Cool. And they sit, have their meal, and like just listen to worship music and... A lot of times their DID would be stilled by the, the presence of the Holy Spirit or the demons would be stilled by it. And like I said, we had demons show up too. <laughs> One of my very first jobs I showed up for Night Strike was to guard the, the, the worship team and the minister preaching. And I go, okay, that's kind of odd because like a bunch of people around us, you know, they're all from different churches. What's going to happen? Lo and behold, once the, the preacher started preaching, the demon possessed showed up. And it was my job to push off the demon possessed and protect the microphone for the preacher. It was, it was, I mean, it's, it got nuts in San Francisco. Now, I'm literally talking about not demonically oppressed. I'm talking about the possessed. And they showed up. Crazy, crazy times. So worship. For street ministry, have someone go out with the street team with a guitar, pick a safe location on the streets where the team can, is ministering, and play acoustic worship to keep the music in the open heaven. If the area is Christian friendly, play the guitar and vocally worship. That's what we did. As we conquered the ground, the statue, we were able to vocally worship. Some places you can't. We went to the Castro, uh, which was a predominantly homosexual gay um, neighborhood. We couldn't vocally worship. Um, you'll have to test the spirits on the street. If the location isn't Christian friendly, play acoustic and keep it simple. In fact, when we played it acoustically in the Castro, it kind of calmed the area we're in. Now, we're in the Castro. A lot of stuff went down um, way back when. It was 2008. There was, um, there was an H8 bill or something came out that went against gay marriage. And a ministry team, there was a lot of riots. I got my team off the streets one night, one Friday night, because there were riots on the streets and there was protesters, and I didn't want my ministry team in jeopardy. And God just said, don't go out tonight. So we called it off. But uh, um, a Justice House of Prayer, or one of them, they went out in the streets and they vocally worshiping in the castro and horrific things happened to him um, beaten and raped and it was it was horrific it made national news on sean hanley or something um, it got bad so when you're street ministering be very careful and very aware of where you're at and if it's not friendly it's not friendly one of the funniest things i ever had in the castro was when we actually went to minister after the riots to um, do prophetic evangelism undercover. I did another man like Michael Dowling in his church. Um, I can't remember his church now. Oh gosh, he had a church out there. Um, it was kind of a cool experience. He, I, and one other person went out there, started doing prophetic evangelism. Like It was like about three months after the riots just to um, test the streets. And we did undercover. And we brought our guitar player. And a cop comes over and goes, do you have a permit for that guitar? And we're like, what? He goes, yeah, I hate to tell you guys, you have to have a permit for the guitar. And while the cop's telling us this, this naked guy who walks down the street, gets a newspaper and walks away. And I go, well, where's his permit? <laughs> he starts laughing. He goes, only in San Francisco. You can be totally naked and walking down the street, but you need a permit for your guitar. I go, oh my God, that's crazy. So we had to stop playing the guitar at that time. Um, but yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's crazy stuff when you counter it. it was funny. Like I said, for Night Strike, we'd been using the UN Plaza at the as a street ministry anchor point um, for decades let me say because it went beyond when i had it i had it for about a decade and i know bill johnson had it for night strike for long beyond that so night strike open heaven worship remains with another minister as a team goes on the streets right they're sitting there making an open heaven worshiping and praying while we the teams go out and minister that's kind of how we worked it I'm being repetitive. I'm beating this in your streets. You need an anchor point where you guys always meet. You need an anchor point you conquer. That's your space. And like I said, that's where your open heaven starts and radiates out from there. As well as having your intercessors who are at home or somewhere with you on the, the streets there. Just, just keeping an open heaven and listening. If you're street ministering in or around your church neighborhood, have a worship team play at the church, right? That's the easy way to do it. In both cases, the worshiper on the streets and the worship leader in a church should be sensitive to the movement of the Holy Spirit during the open heaven. In other words, you guys should be in communication. The worship leader is going, I'm sensing this, or somebody 
with the, um, the worship team is sitting there praying and you know and listening to Jesus and listening to the Holy, the Holy Spirit's movement and possibly texting um, the teams of what they're sensing, what they're feeling goes on in the streets. Back to the Castro, we, when I was working with Michael Dowling, we had something happen where there's um, this group out there. They're called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. They're an anti-Catholic, anti-Christian group. And there's probably about 30 of them in this group. And when they dress up, they look like the nun from The Conjuring. <laughs> it's, it's that scary. They are scary looking. Like, like the nun from The Conjuring would freak out. They'd chase her off the streets. But while we were there, they, they were out looking for Christians to beat up. Because I know Christians come out and um, evangelize the streets of the Castro. So on the Friday night, we were there. Their team went out. It was like about 30 of them. And we didn't see him. We got a text from one of Michael Dowling's intercessors. He's saying, don't worry right now. Or she said it was, um, she said, don't worry right now. God has you hidden, protected at this moment. We're going, what? And we looked over and then went the, the sisters of indulgence right past us. You know, so it was um, it's incredible stuff. You know, when, it, when it's working properly, this whole mechanism is working as it should. It's incredible the stuff you get and the testimonies you get about what happens at certain times and what the intercessors are picking up and how, the open heaven works. I wouldn't go out in the streets without an open heaven. I never did. So ideally, the entire team, the worshipers, the intercessors, and street ministers all meet and worship together. That's how we started, right? We start our anchor point. And the street ministers leave to head to work on the streets. So once your worship's done, you deliver a message on the streets. I usually always gave some quick, short message because the homeless showed up. And, you know, they could be drunk. They could be high of their mind. But they sat and they listened. You know, we gave them food, we gave them socks, but they, they listened to the message. And I said, I was there for over a decade, and Bill, Bob Johnson and his team was there for decades, right? So we knew people changed, but it took time for them to change just by listening to a message or developing relationships with these people. We met over time, just kept meeting with them, who they were. So two, intercession. A team of intercessors can operate remotely in the confines of a church or at someone's home. The intercessors are seers and sensitive to the movement of the Holy Spirit. So I talked about that one case where the intercessors at Michael Dowling's church, you know, they were six miles away. They picked up on the Sisters of Indulgence coming our way. I also had something, too, where I went and worked with, um, I thought it was kind of cool to reach out to uh, a Catholic father who worked with a very... Um, popular let me say paranormal team on tv a while back he's in the east coast and he was going to do an exorcism and house blessing and i i was on a chat list with him and i go hey how about my team intercesses for you and he was oh that'd be great that'd be great um yeah we'll we'll text you what's going on and what's happening and so as we we're doing intercession we kept feeling really weird really sick something's really wrong and this guy like I said is over back east and so i'm texting like we're feeling we need to back out now and shut down now Something's wrong here, and we shouldn't be here. And the father texts back, yeah, my psychic's being attacked too. And I text back, why do you have a psychic on site during an exorcism? You know? And like I said, this guy was a, it was a big wig. He's still big in the paranormal things. Like, you know what? We're shutting down this operation. We're out. We're done. We're not working with you ever again. So it's interesting what you could pick up on in um, doing some of these, uh, setting this, the, the, the ministry up properly with intercession and with open worship. Cool stuff. Just learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. It's very subtle, right? It's, it's, you don't, like, I'm kind of feeling this. And you, that's why you have teams. Are you feeling this too? Yeah, I'm picking up on that too. It's, this is kind of crazy. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. It works. So the intercessor leader communicates with the street leader, again, like I said, by texting, are conveying what they are seeing and feeling. The intercessors are often the first line of defense in averting a spiritual attack. Again, the classic case was the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. We could have got the snot beat out of us. If we weren't covered and Jesus, like he said, don't worry, you're invisible. They're going to pass right by you. And they did. And that was just the craziest, like, wow, that's weird. Scary stuff. It's like being in the presence of the, the nun from the conjuring man, but 30 of them. Crazy, crazy stuff. Ah, team unity. The entire team must be operating in spiritual unity. Yes. We are protected by being in unity of prayer and spirit. Chaos is the weapon of the enemy. I've had this happen several times, including during we were doing ritual abuse survivors. We had to eventually weed out our entire intercession team because they couldn't operate in unity. We had one church who cloned themselves as the, or quoted themselves as the 
the deliverance church here in the area. So at first, I thought, okay, let's work with them because they kind of know what's going on. They didn't. They were so doctrinal. They were causing more spiritual warfare. And at the end, we had to confront them about, like, look, you guys don't really know what you're doing, so we need you off. And then they started <laughs> plastering hate mail all around us and stuff. Like, these guys, you know, the ritual abuse, they don't know what they're doing because they kicked us out of here. Yeah, we had to kick you out because you weren't working in unity with the team. You thought you guys were the only ones that knew how to do intercession. And whatever it was, was really weird. It was ritualistic. And it was what you're trained to do. It was doctrinal. And it's not helping us. So we had to punch you to the streets. Plus their attitudes, too. So it's just, it's, it's crazy. So if there's no unity and there's chaos, get rid of the chaos. Clean it up. Don't go on the streets with chaos. Shut it down right away. Chaos is demonic. Ah, open heaven for outreaches. Open heaven for outreaches requires a considerable amount of planning and leadership organization. From outreaches from zucchini and asparagus festivals to pagan festivals. A significant amount of preparation is needed for the team to operate in the open heaven in predominantly enemy territory. Let's unpack. Pray first and set up first whether you should be at these outreaches. And hear from the Father. Should I? Like, you know... Like these zucchini asparagus festivals, they were kind of cool because they were prophetic outreaches, right? We were able to reach everybody out there, and it was just um, very low-key, non-Christianese languages we were using, where we stripped our church language out and just spoke to the people in simple English of what we were seeing about them, gave them an encounter from the Father, and just kept it low-profile. Now, when you go to a pagan festival, you better damn well know you heard from God to go there. This one is dangerous. And when I heard from God to go there, my response was, you want to do what? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, that's so cool. I want to go to a pagan festival. Let's go. Let's, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's get some people. No. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. Nope. Bad idea. Same thing like going to Burning Man or going to, um, oh, here's a classic one here too. So after doing all these festivals and hearing from God, like, you know, where I should be and shouldn't be, I mean, we went, we took Bethel teams into strip clubs. And we ministered to strippers. We went to some dark places, very dark places. And there was a very big deliverance minister from up north for me who said she had a huge anointing for the West Coast. She was going to go to um, was the, the Folsom Street Fair, which is a gay, naked, sexual, open sexuality um, street fair, and she was going to bring Christians in. And Michael Dowling reached out to me and goes, are you going to go to this? He goes, I know the sort of stuff you do go to. And I go, let me pray about it. And Jesus said, no, no. I went, oh, dear Lord, no. And so I went back to Michael Dowling. I said, I don't think this is a good idea. I said, you know the stuff I've been to, Michael. You know the deep stuff I went to? And I'm saying no. God says no. And so he posted back on the mailing list, like, well, Michael Norton, who works with them, a lot of the occult stuff in this, the city and works with ritual abuse and is, is in tune to this stuff, um, he heard the Jesus say no. And so it kind of batted back and forth because who had the biggest jewels on their head and i didn't want to fight that fight so i let that person take other people in and what i found out later is other people that went to that did get cursed from the environment so it's just it's because somebody's going oh i'm i have anointing go there you know check with jesus first always check with jesus for going and even if it is a person that successfully goes to these outreaches check with jesus first because you may not be the one that's supposed to be going i've had that happen too like jesus i don't want you going okay you know, but then when he tells us, like, I have to go to the pagan festival, I know darn well, loud and clear, oh my God, you want to do what? Set it up. And it was a very powerful, <laughs> it was a very powerful environment and event. And I had the right people from Night Strike who were with me who did it, and we batted it out of the cage. The people knew we were Christians, I was even saying it. It was just crazy stuff. Crazy, crazy stuff. There were some dark people there. So Intercession. Every ministry participant in an outreach must find three to five people, intercessors, who will not be on the outreach to pray for them. So if they're going to, you know, you know from the Zucchini Festival to like a Burning Man or going into strip clubs, and, you know, again, you have to hear from that. I actually had a um, the minister I worked with. She was actually a former stripper from a, Las Vegas who went to the Bethel School Supernatural Ministry. She got saved and she wanted to go back in and get those women out from trafficking. That's what we did, and she knew her environment, and she heard from God, too. So we went and did this, and we had some powerful encounters, but we had some dark encounters, too. So, and you had to have mature people to deal with this. It would freak people out. But yep, the demons show up. They don't want you there. 
one of the places we went to was Mitchell Brothers Strip Club, and it was a principality seat, and we ran some very dangerous stuff there we had to back out of. So intercession is crucial. You go to an outreach, make sure you have an intercessor. One of these five intercessors will be the intercessor captain for the minister. So if I'm reaching out to five people, I'm going to find somebody I know who's a mature intercessor and have them be the captain. I had my Heidi. Heidi was my go-to all the time, and I even set her up as my lead intercessor when I went to the New Age Fairs. She knows who she is. She was awesome. Did awesome. Um, but you need people who can hear and people operate in the prophetic. And the four ministers report what they hear. So we have a team, right? You have five ministers. You have the captain. This is one person. So one person going to the event finds five, three to five ministers or intercessors. These intercessors, one will be captain, and the three to four are just going to be listening. And so it's a, it's a chain of command of information. So the lead intercessor will filter what they hear and forward that information on up to the command to find out what's going on. So I get these texts throughout the day. was about we're hearing this, we're seeing this, look for this person, find this, this is going on, and so forth. And it works really well. So the intercessor captains will report to the event's lead, mature, and seasoned intercessor. Like I said, I had my Heidi. She was my, she was my commander intercessor, right? The captains report to the commander. The intercessor hierarchy is a communication chain for reporting what intercessors hear. Very important, right? So even though you guys are ministering, we don't have time to intercede. We're, we're li listening prophetically. We may pick up stuff in the environment too, which matches what the intercessors are telling us. So it's good stuff to have. Right? It's, it's your intelligence, it's your CIA. The intercession starts for outreaches about three weeks before the event and continues about three weeks after. The enemy usually starts attacking ministers about two weeks before the event, and the worst comes the week of and the day of the event. Intercession continues for three weeks after the event to protect against retaliation. So, if you're a minister going to an event, you need your intercessor praying for protection three weeks before you go. You'll start seeing the enemy ramp up weird stuff a week to two weeks before. In fact, the night I was leaving for Burning Man, I had to trade cars with my son um, because he had a, a truck and I had my little um, Dodge SRT4, which is a high-performance car. And he took it to high school. I, I trust him. He, was, he, drove, you know, he drives great, so I, I don't worry about his driving abilities. But the night of going to Burning Man, we swapped cars. He got in an accident. It was 15 miles per hour or less. No, it was actually less than 15 it crumpled the entire car. It was just to distract me from going to Burning Man. But, you know, all right, it's totaled. What am I going to do? Haul it off. And you'll find two weeks before and two weeks after you're married or in relationships, your relationships get all stirred up. And if you're married, oh my gosh, they'll stir stuff up in your marriage right away. So look for it and report the intercessors. My, our relationships are being attacked. Finances are being attacked. The refrigerator went out. Something's nickel and diming us. Your session continues for three weeks after the event to protect against retaliation from the enemy. Okay, keep that in mind. This is not an example or methodology. It's an example of preparing for outreaches and keeping open heaven. It's about the crazy love of God. Right, we're, we're coming in as loving ministers. We're not there for spiritual warfare. <laughs> I shared this before in Tales of Glory. When I went to the Pagan Festival, I was being prayed out by my church the Sunday before. And another visiting pastor was there, and my senior pastor goes, well, why don't we have this, this visiting pastor pray you guys out? And the first thing he do is gets up and goes, oh, you're on the pagan fair? I bind the enemy, I bind the demons from, blah, 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 and warfare will come, and I'm, I'm going, oh my God, dude. You know, <laughs> that's not what we're going for. So in the back of my mind, I rebuked his entire prayer and told Jesus, that's not now where you're sending us. We're sending us to, as ambassadors, undercover, to change hearts and minds. And so I had to rebuke that guy's entire prayer. That's a story. That's, that's the, um, we went to the Pagan Festival. Um, a couple of my ministers found a guy that uh, was a, a practicing voodoo doctor. He ended up coming to Night Strike with us a couple of times. And he was loving it. He was seeing healings and stuff. So it, like the little gears were turning. But one of the, you know, some other Night Strike person showed up from a, a church we weren't aware of. And they just tore into him like, what's a voodoo guy doing out here on the streets and, you know, working with Night Strike? And, he never came back. He was upset. I was like, well, thank you very much for that because he was solely learning about Jesus. I hope we were a small notch that turned him over you know, to go find something else about Jesus, but we haven't heard back from him. But that's, that's what was the cool fruits of a 
you know, going to a pagan festival. We got a, a voodoo witch doctor going to night strike with us, looking, learning about Jesus. Now he heals. And the guy's mind was, you know, he was seeing it. Full on. Of course, the demon sent somebody from church in to distract him. So it is what it is, man. You'll, you'll, you'll live and learn. You'll just shake your head at what Christians can do. <laughs> a night strike team. Some people wouldn't bring again. Some people left behind. It's like, yeah, get out of here. Spiritual covering. Covering is a spiritual body of Christ, the church. When a church leadership ordains endorsement and protection to a ministry team, it operates under the church covering. So what does this mean? So if you can go out and do supernatural ministry, speak with your pastor saying, hey, keep praying for us. We want the covering of our church. So when the enemy comes, they'll be attacking the church and taking on the church. Good and bad. If you're in a church that's embracing supernatural ministry and already working in it, this is okay. But if you're in a church that's clueless to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, you may be in trouble. What do I mean by that? Attack may come on the church that they're incapable of fighting. In other words, they couldn't fight their way out of paper bags. They don't know their spiritual authority. I, I ran into that too. And God literally gave me my own covering and kind of go, you know, like Elijah and... <laughs> And Moses and, and, and Jacob and Joshua, you know, they, they got their own coverings. I got mine too. So God gave me one. So, but interesting note here, um, from a spiritual warfare perspective, the team is not operating solely by themselves and protected to be picked off by the enemy. The enemy must engage a spiritual church body when it attacks a minister under a church's covering. Outreachers and street ministries need to be spiritually covered. Yes, they do. If you're having problems like with your church covering, just do intercession and pray for your own. Pray for it to come. God will understand. And don't do it in rebellion. Do it like Jesus. We need your help. Be aware of the difference between a covering and human legalism. I was in an environment where it became human legalism. I've seen it several times too, where I'm out in the streets and pastors would show up. Oh, you need my, you need my covering for my church, right? And that's kind of like the indicators are like, oh, your church, huh? That was Jesus' church. And a lot of times they want to provide covering and human legalism. And I, I ran to that too, big time. I was working with um, um, two women who were um, running a counseling agency, and it was a, a ministry. And every time, uh, uh, it was very misogynistic where the pa male pastor came in like, oh, you, you women need my, my covering. You're like, no, you don't. They already have their covering. We're doing ritual abuse. We have a bigger covering you guys have, so don't, you know, go back, you know, scurry away. So it, it would happen with stuff like that. And then I had the issue with my church, too. And eventually, it became very legalistic, and I was a very narcissistic person at the, at the, the pulpit that God goes, I know, God, I need a, a covering and it's not working with this guy and I don't want to be in rebellion. You know what do I do? And then in a dream, he showed me, he gave me covering. And I've had it ever since. It's a very, very powerful one. It's there. Good stuff. In fact, Derek Prince said, beware. He hasn't said this. I got to find the video. That covering is nothing more than human legalism from a church standpoint. In other words, that, that it, they can control your ministry and do other stuff through it too since you're under their covering. I kind of found that to be that too. So there's two different flavors of covering. One what's a very misogynistic or very you know, narcissistic. Um, you'll be under my covering. Like, no, I'll be under Jesus' covering. Or there's the Jesus covering. And just ask for Jesus' covering if you can't, you're not with the church or not, you know, not endorsing what you're doing or not helping you. Pray for Jesus' covering and, you know, continually do that and petition him and you'll, you'll eventually get it. You know, crazy stuff. Crazy, crazy stuff. So let me know if this is interesting to you guys. This was, um, this was like module five. This is called the um, open heaven, how to keep an open heaven on the streets or an outreach. So it's if something you guys are interested in. I have like four other modules. And it's not just that. It's on hearing God and doing other stuff on the streets and how to do street ministry. It goes beyond the soup kitchen. I wasn't a soup kitchen guy. I had to literally be out in the streets and in the trenches, you know, and laying hands on people and talking to their faces and giving encounters with God. That's the way it was. So if this... Is interesting to you. I'm, I guess I'm going to slap together the entire module, all five of them, probably put it out for Buck 99 as digital download. You guys have something in front of you to look at as we go through this. And that's it. You know, I hope you guys run with this. My intention here is for you guys to run with this and go out and start doing street ministry. Find someone in your town, you know, and, and we'll talk more about this, how to do it. Because people have been asking me, how do you do it? I think this is an important thing about how to set up a team initially and set out an anchor point where you guys will always meet and move out from when you bring out the food and your supplies or give them to the homeless. So 
Go out there and be a blessing. I love you guys. And remember, this will be on a field guide to spiritualwarfare.blogspot.com. This is episode 57. Um, Night strike training, street ministry training. And like I said, we're, we're trying to produce more content and get it out to you guys here. There's an interest to street ministers and to the little guys. You know, we're talking to the few. We're talking to the foot soldiers here. That's who this podcast is for, the foot soldiers on the streets. So, um, guys like, we, we always take donations. We need help here to <laughs> keep the lights on the M16 bunker. You can send it to M16 Ministries at PayPal. Uh, excuse me, send it to PayPal. I keep doing that, man, tongue tire. Send it, we can reach us via, via PayPal at M16 Ministries at gmail.com. Send donation. We'd love to receive that to help us out, get, get the podcast going and keep things alive here. I love you guys, and go ahead and try applying this. You know, put it together. If you guys are scratching your head about street ministry, you know, get one or two worshipers, put a small team together, and try this stuff out. See how it works. Map it out. It's it's kind of like a roadmap. You know, it's not it wasn't a methodology, just a roadmap of things to consider and go do, and how to conquer a space. If you're doing street ministry, especially with the homeless, or if you're going to do an outreach. How do you start an outreach? This I think I gave you guys the, um, the ground, you know, the groundbreaking pieces to this. So that you know, start digging a. <laughs> the, the new foundations for what you guys are going to build. I love you guys and signing off the M16 bunker. God bless. Amen. <laughs>